Hi there, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Sorensen, as was mentioned. Um, I'm an assistant director here at Miami University, um, and uh, just in my first year in the position there, so excited to have you here with us today. Hi, my name is Crystal White. I'm also an assistant director here, and our title is, Hey, I Just Met You. Are You Crazy? Mental Health in the Office. Um, we wanted to let you know that this is a session that we have the opportunity to do in OCPA, and we thought it would be neat to do that for our region. And so um, we want you to use Twitter if you have it. And so we have the hashtags here on the screen, hashtag Lukuho and hashtag H underscore W for wellness. You can tweet any comments or questions there, and we'll check those. And if you do not have Twitter, we do want you to go ahead and use the chat feature um, and send your questions to our moderator. Okay, so what this presentation is not, it's not filled with advice from mental health professionals, because we are not mental health professionals. Um, it is not filled with legalities, because we are not legal counsel. And it's also not a replacement for your department, HR uh, department. And we share this with you because our stake in this, um, for instance, um, being committed to the field, being committed to student wellness, um, and the fact that we encourage our students to always maintain wellness, we, we believe that there's a piece where we don't allow staff to take care of themselves and be well, or we don't talk about it as much. And so we wanted to make sure that we highlighted that. Um, and the other piece I wanted to add is um, we have personal stakes in making sure that there's, there's wellness, um, because either family members or some of the things that uh, we deal with ourselves with, with um, some of the things that we deal with ourselves. So we, we just wanted to put that out there as far as why we're invested in this issue. Uh, so we're going to start out. We're going to we're going to share some uh, some folks with you here. Um, uh, so uh, we'll let you know who they are as we go. Um, but hopefully you'll recognize uh, some of these folks, um, uh, and maybe all of them. But we'll let you know as we go. Uh, so this is Mel Gibson. Probably a lot of you uh, recognize him. Uh, we have uh, Brooke Shields. Uh, we have John Nash. Uh, we have uh, Carrie Fisher here. And think about what all these people have in common as we go through this. We have Emma Thompson. We have Paula Dean. That's usually a crowd pleaser. We have Michael Phelps. We have Elton John, we have Howard Hughes, we have uh, Walter Payton, I knew I was going to forget somebody, and uh, Sinead O'Connor, as well as Kurt Cobain. Uh, so I want you to take a second to think about what those people have in common. Um, we know certainly all, all successful people within their fields, uh, a lot of celebrities represented from a wide variety of walks of life. Um, and, and we give it away a little bit with the topic of our presentation. Uh, these are all folks who, who have uh, uh, mental health conditions that they've disclosed and, and are open about. Uh, we, have, we have a wide variety represented here. Uh, we have everything from anxiety disorders to depression, uh, postpartum depression. Brooke Shields has been really open about her experience with that. Um, schizophrenia is represented on this list. ADD is, is uh, represented on this list. Um, so I want you to think a little bit about that. And, and, and what we want you to think about right now is which of these people surprised you that they were on this list um, uh, and maybe why that was. Uh, I think that's important to think about as we move forward uh, with the rest of our presentation. Okay, the outline um, for this presentation, we're going to begin with our learning outcomes. Then we're going to talk about um, stigma surrounding mental health. We're going to talk about how your mental um, wellness affects your work. And then supervising someone who discloses a mental health condition. Um, also, we'll get into approaching a colleague with care and concern. And then lastly, we'll talk about taking care of our own mental wellness at work. So our learning outcomes for today, um, you'll be able to understand the myths and the stigma surrounding mental health. You'll be able to describe the importance of monitoring the mental health and wellness of coworkers and yourself, list available resources to those in a stressful work environment, and describe strategies for self-care and self-awareness around one's own mental wellness. So like we talked about, one of the, one of the important things we talk about today is, is this idea of stigma. Um, and obviously, uh, sharing those celebrities with you was a piece of that. We see these people who are very successful. Uh, oftentimes, when we've presented this before, we'll have conversation about, about, about what surprises you about these people being on the list. And we hear things like, well, these are all really successful people. They seem really put together, is, is something we heard um, in our presentation previously. Um, um, so then what does that mean to the opposite? What does that mean for when we find out they have a mental health condition or issue? Do we think otherwise? Do we think they're not put together? So something important to think about. Uh, a conversation that Crystal and I have had that I think is important to this topic is this idea of our, of our physical health versus our mental health. Uh, we have two pictures uh, down here at the bottom, and, and 
uh, is that idea of, of who's healthy, who, who looks sick in these pictures. Um, uh, the one on the left certainly looks like he's, he's physically ill. Um, I think we searched fever in clip art to find that one. Um, uh, and, then, and then on the right, we have someone who's, who seems to be uh, talking to a counselor. And do we have a thought that that person's sick? What do, what do we think of that, and what does that mean to us? Um, this idea of how you treat a fever is important. We know what we do when we start to feel sick. Maybe you, you get a fever, you take your temperature, uh, maybe, maybe you start to feel a cold coming on, and we all know what we would do. Uh, take a minute and think about that. What, what would your reaction be? What would you tell a friend to do? They say, oh, I think I'm coming down with a cold. We'll do this. Take this medicine or, 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 or put, this, put this hot pack on your head. Uh, take, take, uh, you, know, you may have some, some concoction that grandma used to make that will cure it right up. Uh, so think about those things. And then why is mental health different? Because I, I, would, I would certainly argue that it is. Um, that we have this idea that, that certainly we, we, we know of some things that can help with mental health, but they look different, and it's not so simple as, as we all have an easy solution, or what do you do when you don't feel right mentally uh, as opposed to physically. We, we, see, we see a difference there. So in terms of thinking about how your uh, mental wellness affects your work, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this over to Crystal to chat about that. Okay. So the first question essentially is how honest can you be with your coworkers and your supervisor? Um, the first day of work, do you sit down with your supervisor and say, I'm dealing with depression and anxiety? Um, and if you do that, what is the cost of discussing your emotions in a work setting? I think we, we work in a field that sometimes people can say, oh, we're fluffy, we're emotional, there's a lot of blues, there's a lot of feelings, etc. But when it talks about taking care of ourselves or someone um, is dealing or struggling with, um, you know, feeling sad or blue for longer than what's expected or what's quote unquote normal, it gets into the sticky piece. Um, I've heard comments as, as, as such as people, they'll say, oh, that person should just take medication or X, Y, Z. And so when there's these stigma pieces there, is this a safe and comfortable environment to really bring those things up in our work setting? I think we'll ask the question of each other, you know, how are you? How's your day? And it's a lot easier to say fine and to disclose, I'm really struggling and I need some help. Will you be a support for me? Um, the next piece is, you know, when do you disclose if you have a condition? Is it the first day? Is it when there's something that triggers you in the work setting and you need to sit down with your supervisor or sit down with a peer to work through that? Um, and do you need to disclose? How does it affect your work? What do you need from your supervisor? You have to identify that for yourself. If you're a member of the mental health community, um, I know for myself, um, I am a member, and so I had to think about, do I want support? Do I want someone to listen to me? Do I need referrals to resources? And I think this is a question that anyone can ask, um, mental health condition or not, but I think it's more important to figure out what do you need when you have that conversation. The last piece that's very important um, is what do you need to provide to HR? If the mental, con the mental health condition that you have is going to have an impact on how you do your work, you need to be able to talk to the um, human resource department and find out what, you know, help work with them to see what com accommodations can be provided and then also let them know what you need. And one of the most important things that goes here is that you still need, you still have to be able to do your job. And so a mental health condition does not, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this, it, it, it doesn't mean you can't do your work because you still need to show up and do the work that you do every day. And so putting it out there, there are some pros because there's a better understanding if you need something a little different, but you still need to be able to perform your work. Um, it's also important to be aware of any um, employee uh, assistance programs that are offered on your campus. You can find that out through HR, through your benefit package, because they offer um, counseling that's confidential and separate from the university that can also be pretty beneficial. So the next slide that we want to get into is when you supervise someone who discloses a mental health condition. So this is on the other side. This goes from if you have a mental health condition, decision, a condition, sorry, of what should you do to, wow, someone just came to me and shared that. Our responsibility is to find out what is our legal obligation um, to help that person to make sure we're providing a comfortable and safe environment equal to what we offer to our other employees. And so what is a legal obligation, and then what accommodations are needed, and how can we make that happen? The thing that's very important, particularly one-on-one, -on -one, is to make sure you have a trusting and open relationship so you can discuss um, the condition that the person has. And you want to explore this person's comfort level um, as well. 
Um, so the other piece that we want to get into, at what point do you counsel out of the position? Now this is really tricky. Everyone is capable of, of performing their job. Having a mental health condition does not mean you cannot work in student affairs. If there is a point where there's a candidate, mental health condition or not, that says, hey, I can't do conflict, I can't talk about crisis, et cetera, et cetera, then maybe it's a conversation of, is this too much or too taxing because you are not able to perform your job that's expected of you. And so everyone is capable, but I think it's figuring out what, what is that person's capacity to be successful and to be well and, and do the job that we need them to do. The last point on this slide talks about respecting the boundaries of friend versus supervisor. And this one is important because how much are you, how much is that person sharing with you? Are you giving them advice? Are you serving as counselor? Are they getting into details that you feel may be a little bit over your head and vice versa? And so remembering that it's important to focus on that professional piece of the work um, because once you get into the friendship zone, if you will, that can be a little sticky. So making sure overall what do we need to provide so that person can do their work and then, you know, is it a matter of you have a relationship with that person where you can check in and say, hey, things are a little different today. How are you feeling versus did you take your meds today? Might not be the best approach. And it's uh, the, thank you for those of you who are, who are tweeting as we go along too. It's really fun to, to watch and see what you're saying. And, and this, this important question came up, and Crystal talked about this a little bit, and I want to address it a little bit more. Um, uh, this question of what's the cost associated with uh, disclosing a mental health condition to a supervisor. And, and I think that we would certainly be the first to acknowledge, as Crystal said, there is, there is potential cost associated with that. And it's important to know. Uh, we are not advising anyone to do that. That's up to you. Uh, you are under no obligation to disclose a condition. And, and part of that is this challenge of, of stigma. Uh, uh, what does it mean to someone to hear that? Um, and that's partly why we offer this suggestion to supervisors as well. Um, uh, how can you receive that information in a way that's going to feel comfortable for, for, your, for the person you're supervising? Um, so I think that is really important. And, and, and I think from my own experience uh, uh, supervising, I, I think, uh, like Crystal said in, in this slide, when that trusting relationship exists, uh, that's when that becomes a little bit easier. So I think that is a really important thing to think about. And there's no right answer for, for any, any person, but, but that's, I think that's going to be really important um, uh, to think about as, as we uh, move forward and as you engage those, uh, those types of relationships. So we do have this, this um, from our friends at University of Michigan. So thank you for, uh, for having this resource. Um, uh, we're going to jump to this website so you can take a look at it. Um, and so we'll have to pop back into our, uh, to our presentation. So you'll have to forgive us as we deal with the technology here a little bit. Um, but this is a really fantastic resource that we found and, and, and fit really directly into this topic which we're discussing. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a document that talks about promoting mental health in the workplace. And initially, you can see right there, 42 pages, so you know it's a, it's a healthy document here. Um, and, and something to think about as we take a quick look at this, I uh, just encourage you to take a look at this. Um, when you get a chance, we can provide the link to folks if you're interested. We can tweet that out. Um, but you can see here it talks about University of Michigan, how their uh, supervisors, managers, and et cetera, uh, uh, can work with faculty and staff who have a mental health or substance misuse problem. Uh, and, and initially, when we presented this at our state conference, uh, we had a few slides that listed out some of these points, but we thought it would be more helpful uh, in, in an online setting to just show you this document. Um, so there's a ton of information here. And, and you can see here, uh, it goes through sections. Um, the second section talks about what you need to know about mental health problems and substance misuse. So it really is more of a, of a content-based section. Uh, talks about so, some things worth knowing. Um, uh, and, and some, some knowledge pieces there. Um, and then it does have a section about um, the American with Disabilities Act, which is, which is important to take a look at. Um, sometimes in cases, you'll also want to be aware if you're in a position to deal with this sort of thing. Um, there may be FMLA uh, pieces here. So again, you'll want to be checking with your legal counsel and working with employees in HR uh, if there is a situation in which they need to take some time off. Uh, what reasonable accommodations look like can vary uh, so it's important to, to work with people to do that. Um, one of my favorite sections of this is this section four component. Um, and and it's, it's how do you engage in this conversation. And I think there's some really fantastic 
uh, information here, uh, to bullet points that say, here are some things to think about as you, as you talk to people uh, in this kind of a situation, uh, including this, this last bullet point you see here, addressing imminent health and safety concerns. So some great resources here, and again, more than we have time to cover here, and, and we won't go through the whole thing, uh, but we'll, we'll send, you the, send you the link to this if you're interested. Uh, we, uh, you're welcome to tweet that. We'll tweet that out. Uh, additionally, uh, our emails are up in, in our slides as well, so you're welcome to send that to us as well. But we'll, we'll move forward on that. But I encourage you to take a look at that. So a couple of things that came up on, on the Twitter feed is someone said, you know, in, my, in their experience, there's a higher cost in disclosing a mental health issue to peers than a supervisor. I completely agree with that, and I would love to see more folks uh, respond to that tweet. Um, it's under the um, Kukuho hashtag. Um, I think there can also be a, a high cost with the supervisor as well, um, and because sometimes people can watch you more, or if you have, you're having just a regular bad day, there's this assumption or a conclusion that's come to that, oh, maybe it's because of X, Y, Z. And so I think we have to be really careful with, you know, how often do you want to share and with who, um, because I, I don't walk around disclosing my sexual orientation to people. And so I put this as, with another ism. My first conversation is, not you know, a handshake and, hey, I have depression. And so, again, I'm glad that um, Sarah tweeted that because we do have to think about what that looks like. Are we alienating ourselves? But then that's the stigma piece. We should be able to talk about parts of our identity and, and be welcomed like everyone else too. So. And, and speaking further to that stigma piece, I think it's important to think about uh, the language that we're using, uh, and, and, and we'll touch on this again later, but now is as good a time as any. Um, uh, and, and in part, uh, I like to share this story. Uh, when we first uh, planned the title of our presentation, uh, Crystal and I sat in my office, we had a 45-minute conversation about the title of our presentation, and we went back and forth on a lot of different title ideas. And we talked a lot about, about what to call this presentation so that we're addressing this language piece and this stigma piece without feeding into that. And, and I don't know how good of a job we did. You're welcome to give us feedback on that. Um, but ultimately, um, we want to address that, that we use this type of language like crazy. Um, uh, the, one I, the one I share with people, and maybe you've heard this too, wackadoodle has become very popular. Um, uh, but, but we talk about these things as if, as in, in very flippant ways, I think, and it's, it's very serious to people who who do uh, have these conditions, and what happens if someone overhears you say something like that about a student or a staff member? Um, I think that's challenging. And again, we're not the word police. We're not interested in saying, don't say this, don't say that. Uh, but think about that, and think about what language you hear um, uh, in those environments, uh, and in the work environment in particular. What are we doing to create a comfortable, safe environment where someone would be willing to say something, or, or want to, or feel supported? Uh, that, that, to me, is a really important piece. So keep that in mind. I think that's something we can directly control within our workplace. Uh, so we also talked about, uh, we were fortunate to uh, meet with uh, Kip Alicio, our director of the Counseling Center, who deserves a, a shout out on this. He, uh, he helped us a lot with content in this presentation. And, and we talked about how do you approach a colleague if you see them acting in a way that maybe is atypical for them if you know them well, or maybe it's the first day, it's the first day of training and you say, wow, they're, they're acting in a way that I, I don't see people normally act, um, again, using normal loosely. Uh, but, but what are some ways to approach that, I think, is, is hopefully a good takeaway from this presentation. And, and one thing to think about, and the first thing we say here, is be familiar with your university guidelines. This jumps back to know what's okay for you to say and what not to say based on your position within an organization. Uh, uh, you don't want to run up to someone and say, hey, do you have this condition? Obviously, you all know that. Um, but, but how do you phrase that, even if you, even if you have that conversation? Um, so know those things, know about what your HR policies are, um, uh, if it, it may not be, you may not be the best person to reach out. Um, uh, being an active listener, um, I think it's important to, um, to, to use those active listening skills that you have. Um, uh, making sure that you're being respectful in the way that you ask those questions and interact. Um, really important and sort of the, the, really, the focal point of our presentation is to talk about um, not to stigmatize or make assumptions. Um, uh, that, to me, is, is one of the most important pieces. I, I find that if people feel comfortable, um, they're more likely to tell you these things, and they're more likely to, to want to have this type of a conversation because they know they'll be supported. 
we hear this a lot, and I think Crystal mentioned this earlier, but this idea of, oh, are you off your medication, uh, uh, some of those types of assumptions that are really dangerous. Um, uh, and and there's, they're, they're honest questions, I think. The intent is not bad, but certainly we know the impact can be, and, and, and uh, I think those are important things to keep in mind. Uh, we, we, I think it, I talk about this a lot, and I do a lot of suicide prevention training as well, but this idea of check in because you care and communicate that clearly. Uh, it's okay to ask someone how they're doing and say, I want to know how you're doing because I care about you. Um, and particularly as a peer, I feel like peer to peer, this, this feels good to me. Um, to say, you know, I care about you a lot, and I just want to make sure you're okay, and I would be comfortable doing that day one. Um, not everybody necessarily would, um, but, but for those people who you think need some reaching out, um, encourage you to do that and, and express that concern and care, I think are all important pieces to think about as you are approaching this conversation. Okay, we want to move into the, the stigma pieces that we've been getting at. Um, are you taking your medication? I, there are several ways to, um, and you'll see in the second bullet, um, to improve, if you will, uh, and maintain a, a healthy life with, uh, if you're dealing with or living with a mental health condition. And so we have to remember that it's not always about medication. Things can be treated, um, improved, and worked through, and there are several options. And so that's really up to the person who has that mental health condition to make sure that they're getting the help that they need. And then also, as we mentioned earlier, you know, working with HR and just um, seeing what resources are being provided because, again, that's a, a great thing that you can find through your benefits. Um, I think when we get into the part of stress versus mental wellness, it's very easy to jump to this person has had X amount of sad days and so something must be quote unquote wrong with them. Maybe they have anxiety, they're depressed. I think we threw around the terminology, oh, that was schizophrenic, or et cetera. And so there's good stress, there's bad stress, and so I think we need, need to um, be aware of ourselves and what that feels like and looks like, and is, am I stressed out, or is there something more going on to where I may need to speak to someone? Because I've been really sad for two weeks, and I'm not sleeping, and all these things are happening, and this is not uh, normal for me in, in my day to day, and so filling out which one is which. And then are we less likely to help? Eric's going to talk about this a little more. Here's, we, uh, I'll get, let him talk about that, but here's why this question is, is pretty exciting for me. Um, and someone talked about this on Twitter as well. We have teams that talk to you, our students, we just rush in, there's a psychological you know, response team, let's, let's get in there, but we don't really do that for our staff. And I think in a field where we're expected to be resources, maybe we don't speak up because we're worried about what people will think about us. You know, I just announced in a webinar, I have depression. You know, I, I, will, this, will there be ramifications? Will someone see my name and think, wow, that person has X, Y, Z. I don't know if they'll be okay here. I think there's a cost that, that comes along with that. But I think also my initial fears in asking for help was tied back to what will people think of me and who do I share this with. And after being more comfortable almost two years into um, my diagnosis, it's like I feel better. But there was that first piece of I am a helper. I respond to this stuff. What do you mean? Like, How is this possible? And so I think it's important to look at that because not only does it happen for our professional staff members, it can also happen for our RAs and Eric's going to get into that. Yeah, and certainly here's hoping to uh, us continuing to move into a world and in communities where, where it's okay to ask for help. Uh, we'll keep working towards that goal. Um, uh, we have some data uh, here here uh, uh, regarding our um, our mental health first aid training, and there, there was a national uh, survey that was conducted, and we have our university's data. Um, and, and what we found, and anecdotally, I, I think this will make sense to those of you who work with student staff, uh, RAs were significantly less likely to seek out help and seek out uh, counseling resources or even tell anybody um, if they were if they were felt like they had a mental health issue or concern, um, or even knowing that they had maybe maybe were, were diagnosed with clinical depression, but still wouldn't tell anybody and weren't comfortable telling a supervisor. So um, again, that probably doesn't surprise you, but we do have data to back that up as well. So we're looking at how we can incorporate more of that into training. Of, of, I think it goes beyond self-care. It's it's the same idea and the same piece, but we're, 
but I know for us at least we're not communicating it in a way in which students are going to do it. Um, the, the RA student staff data was significantly lower than the general student population, um, and I thought that was that was notable. Um, uh, that we know that our student staff are less likely to ask for help, and I think Crystal uh, hit that spot on. That it has a lot to do with with you, you need to seem strong. There's this association between uh, between uh, seeking help and weakness, which I would certainly strongly disagree with, but um, that stigma is certainly out there. So, so we do have data to back that up, and if, if anyone's interested in that, I'm happy to chat more about that. Um, so another piece to think about mental wellness in our line of work, uh, and this fits into what Crystal was saying as well, there may be topics that trigger you, um, and, and that could be anything. This goes beyond mental health and wellness, I think, and, and so it may be difficult for you to be the, the point person at all times, and to me, that becomes how do we work as a community and as an organization to find the best people to reach out. Um, um, and, and then sometimes it may be you, and maybe you can help a colleague who maybe has, has a topic that's difficult to talk about uh, with someone, and you can step in and assist them. Uh, so something to think about. Uh, we've gotten uh, uh, again, some, of, some of the Twitter conversations surrounded around this and, and enjoying reading that. Uh, but this idea of what prevents us from being open and honest with our feelings at work. Um, and then what about our personal lives? Sometimes even within our personal lives with our friends. If your friends ask you how you're doing, and you maybe are, are in a, a difficult place, you may not say, I'm in a difficult place, even with these people you trust and you know care about you. Um, so then it becomes even more difficult at work where you may not have those as deep of friendships. Now, you certainly may have some of those people at work as well, um, but I think it makes it difficult if your boss comes to you and says, how's your day, and it's a really bad day, how open and honest could you be? I'm sure some of you could say very, but I'm sure some would say I wouldn't tell them. So something to think about. So, so keep those things in mind as, as, as we move forward. And, and really, to me, the takeaway there is how can we do a better job of that? Um, how can we encourage others? It's OK to be open and honest and have those conversations. And I think all the advice we gave about how you approach it, how you welcome that conversation, and how you avoid the stigma, I think all those things will help. Uh, it, it's a slow building process. But um, one tweet that we received, it says, um, the supervisor doesn't gossip in the same circles that our peers might, and trust is important. And I, I think that's a beautiful point because it's easy to just sit down and say, oh my gosh, can you believe that so-and-so, and they did this, and they did that. And then when it stays at that level, someone has to be the person to say, wow, I've noticed that too. How about we, you know, one of us nominate that person and say, let's go check in on our friend. Because... I mean, think about high school and gossiping. Like, it's never fun. And I think when we think about bullying, et cetera, you know, as adults, my hope is that if you see something happening with your peers or you become aware of information, that one person will reach out and say, I'm noticing this. It seems like you're struggling. How can I help you? What can I do? And then with that role, also say, you know what? You don't know what that person is going through. Like, if you have a question, you should talk to them. So it's redirecting them back because, again, I, I can't stress enough how, you know, I don't walk around introducing myself saying, hi, I'm Crystal, I have depression, or hi, I'm Crystal, I'm heterosexual, et cetera. And so I think how do we encourage people to have that one-on-one -on -one dialogue and follow up with their colleague? That's so important to take, that we take care of each other and not add to the confusion or frustration or that person's own management of what they're dealing with in their life every day. So taking care of yourself, you, <laughs> in caps, just to, just to stress it. Um, so here, we wanted to give you all some practical stuff. Um, whether or not you're a member of the mental health community, I believe that this, these are things that you should be doing anyway. Because our work, um, we, you know, when we talk to our grads, we say, it's a 20-hour week assistantship. It's not. <laughs> we know that. Um, because that's the nature of our work, um, I think it's very easy to... Um, sync our work email with our iPhone, and then we have our personal email, and then it's dinging all times of the night, and we have to respond to that. And that can also lead to a level of self-care that's unhealthy. Um, or I'm going to work on that paper or work on that project till 3 in the morning, and so prioritizing what can wait, because again, that can lead to, um, I would say, dysfunction like in your life. And so no matter you know, if you're, community, you're in the community or not, I think that's important to, to keep track of that. So at work, setting manage, manageable goals each day, um, being efficient, efficient with your time at work, 
asking for flexibility, something that I do, if I'm having a particularly rough day, um, I'll say, hey, can I take a longer lunch today? I don't do that often. Or sometimes, you know, I'll say, hey, I'm going to have my door closed for a couple of hours. So if people are looking for me, I, I think those are reasonable things if I know I need a little bit of downtime to just kind of regroup or process. Um, that flexibility can be, you know, hey, I worked pretty late last night for an on-call situation. I didn't get enough sleep, et cetera. Can I have a little bit, you know, can I come in a little later? I think that's reasonable. Um, that taking five minutes is important. Tuning into your needs. How am I feeling? Let me do a self-check. Stepping back, how is Crystal doing? How is Eric doing? Um, communicating effectively. Again, everything I said with my team, I'll say, hey, you know, I'm taking some time today. Um, if you need me, feel free to email me, but I'm not going to be around, you know, for half an hour. Or, um, or just say, hey, if you need to reach me, this place, that place, et cetera. Um, give yourself a break. No one's perfect. Allow yourself to be human. I block off my lunch breaks every day. In the morning, I block off an hour for admin time. And so that's my break time to catch up, because otherwise, I'm out of sorts. <laughs> and so giving yourself a break, take the lunch break away from your office. A lot of us schedule meetings during lunch. I think it's important to think about, are you sitting down and having a little bit of quiet time or some time that's meaningful to you throughout the day, where there's not as much stress or pressure? At home, things that can be helpful, um, turning off your PDA or, again, not syncing your work email with your iPhone, or you can actually turn that function off at 5 o'clock if your job permits you to do that, um, uh, depending on your responsibilities. Divide and conquer. Um, don't overcommit. I think it's very easy to spend time with people um, like, oh, I'll go to this social. Oh, I'll do this. I'll do that. And then you don't really have time to be home. Um, get some uh, take advantage of your company's employee assistance program, staying active, whether that be a Zumba class, walking and enjoying the beautiful sights of campus, um, just doing something. And then treat your body right. You need to take lunch breaks or have snacks in your office, drink water. I think it's very easy for us to be on really odd schedules again um, because of the nature of our work. And so are you sleeping? Are you eating? Are you taking care of you? And the most important, get help if and when you need it, um, and that's that self-check and being in tune. Very good. So that takes us to a, a point to uh, ask what questions you have. Uh, like we said, there's been some coming uh, across Twitter, and we've looked at those. Eric, do, do you have any questions that were typed in that, that we can address? Um, at this point, I don't have any questions that have come in. Um, it looks like the majority of them are coming across over Twitter. Yeah, perfect. So if you have other questions you want us to address, we'll take a glance through here, but feel free to send those in. We're happy to, uh, to answer any questions you all have. And, and so one thing that came across, um, it says, does your department truly support your employees to take care of themselves? Is there comp time? Is there late night? If you have a late night, does that equal a late morning? I think particularly those who are in the job search, you have to think about how you ask that question, obviously, so get a little bit of coaching on that. But you want to know what type of department you're coming into. Um, are they supportive of family? Are they supportive of wellness, personal development? What does that look like? Be really observant. And in your current situation, I think it's okay to sit down and have a conversation with your supervisor and say, you know, I went to this web, you know, I saw this webinar, you know, I want to have a conversation about self-care and what we're doing to support other and our employees here in the department, if you manage a team, if you supervise professionals, I think it's extremely important for you to think about, are you encouraging them to think about how they integrate work life with home life? Is there a sense of balance? If you notice you're getting 2.30 in the morning emails from your staff and it could wait until 9 the next morning, you have to follow up with your staff and show them that you care about them, but you also need to model that. That's, that's the best thing you can do is, 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 uh, is model that for your employees. And then um, Lori Berry uh, said, you know, be authentic. Um, and then someone else said, you know, when we role model self-care, others will follow. Um, and self-care is something we hear often, but it's also one that deserves frequent repetition. I think, I think we do talk about it quite a bit. I don't think we're doing it. And so how do we talk, when you get ready to plan your staff training, um, when you do professional development for your department, 
not, you know, when you talk about mental wellness, that's a nice entryway to get into the self-care piece and also talk about the stigmas associated. It's, it's almost a safety net. Of we want everyone to be uh, comfortable and, and, and adapt and do well here. And let's talk about mental health um, and, and concerns and issues and questions. I think it's a, it's a, a way to kind of, I don't want to say sneak into it, but a safe starting place. And I think another piece of that is, is giving, giving individuals space. Um, uh, it's mentioned here, uh, uh, I think Jenny tweeted that uh, mental health is personal, and, and totally agree with that. Um, and, and I think it's important to, to let people come to you. Um, uh, you know, certainly okay if you see something that you think it's concerning to ask if they're okay. I think that's always okay, regardless of what it is, uh, be, it a, be it a mental health uh, uh, issue or, or, or maybe they're having a bad day. It's good for us to ask and, and check how our days are going. We certainly do that in our office um, and encourage you all to do that as well. Um, but, but I think it's important to give folks space and, and to say, well, I'm here if you need to talk. Um, you just let me know, and, and if you're having a bad day, let me know, and, and we do that for each other. And um, I, I think, like others are saying, if you're open about it, it does make a big difference. But but you can't force somebody to come talk to you. I know we want to help, but but we need to give people that space as well. So so balancing that is tricky. It's challenging. Um, whoever you're thinking about, when I say that, you know that person better than I do. Um, so so I trust you to navigate that relationship. But a lot of it is navigating those relationships and. And, and being supportive um, while being respectful of, of privacy as well. And another thing that I think is important um, to think about with self-care, I'm going to get into that. In the meanwhile, if you you want to uh, keep tweeting, uh, tweeting <laughs> comments and questions, please do so. But at the presentation we did at OCPA, we had a grad that asked a question or gave an example, and they said there was a student that kept going to one of the admin staff repeatedly and would just share things. And it just got to a point where the grad was uncomfortable because they felt that this admin assistant was turning into a counselor for the students. And I think that's an important part of self-care because, and then that supervisor friend boundary as well, because you are not that person's counselor. It can be very dangerous if you set yourself up to start building this person's life. You need to make sure that you're being a referral agent, you're passing that person along, and then as we think about our admin staff, are we providing training as well to make sure that our admin staff know that, that they know what resources are available. So this is all professional staff. This is not just, you know, RDs, assistant directors, et cetera, grads. We want to make sure that our admin staff know how to support students, how to support each other, and so I think that's an important element of training. Um, Kate just uh, tweeted, allow folks to come in you and disclose so that you care and remain respective. I think you have to suspend all judgment. And you just have to sit there and think. And it's not the time to say, oh, well, my brother has schizophrenia. Wow. You know, I can be there. It's sitting down and listening and seeing how and if you can be a resource for that person. And I think when someone discloses any of their isms, it's, it's a very personal thing. Um, I, I don't think you need to pat them on the back and say, yeah, thanks for telling me. I knew it. You know, I think you really need to think about what, why did they select you and then talk about what are their expectations of this relationship now that they've disclosed this. Well, we're not um, getting any more questions, which is fine. We're going to move on to our additional resources. Um, and we can tweet these as well for folks. These are some of the websites that we used and we found to be particularly helpful around mental health uh, concerns, issues. And um, if you could utilize those again for training, conversations, find a couple articles, I think this is a great professional development topic to just sit around and really delve into what does this look like. I think when we talk about incidents with our students, um, some of the language we use to describe them can be said in a joking manner as we got to, and so you never know who's around the table. So just kind of being cognizant of that and, and, and checking in, I think that's, that's probably the best thing that we can do. And another one uh, piece that's interesting here in these additional resources, uh, this first link um, talks specifically about uh, what if it's your boss. Uh, we had this question come up in our presentation at OCPA, which I thought was a great question, and we, we had thought about as well. Um, we talked about if you supervise someone or a peer, but, but what if it's your supervisor that, that you want to check in and see how they're doing? I think that creates, creates a different challenge. Um, uh, and again, I think all, all the pieces that we talked about are still valid. 
um, this idea of come from a caring place. Uh, if you feel like you're the right person to do it, you may not, and that's okay too. Um, you know, you don't have to throw on your cape and, and run around and save everybody. But again, as a community, as an organization, who is the best person to talk to, to talk to that person? I think having a conversation of care and concern for someone uh, is different than gossiping. And, and, and how you can do that and go to someone in the department and say, hey, have you noticed this too? Is there a good way for us to approach this? Seek, seek that advice um, if you feel like that's a place for you. I would certainly understand if one didn't feel like that was their place, and I think that's okay too. Um, it, it doesn't always make sense all the time, but, but there is this document that has some advice on that. If you feel strongly about doing that, um, it would be good to seek advice and maybe check out that document and see what, what, if you find anything helpful there. The last two things that I'll add is, um, and this is from uh, M.K. Norton, I think she maybe retweeted, um, it is okay to spend time constructing a reply if one is warranted. And that, what that sparked for me was when someone comes and discloses something to you, any ism, if you will, you, know, you don't have to say anything right back. And based on your past experiences, hearing some of the stories, or just hearing that may trigger you as well. And so knowing, as with anything that triggers you, gauging a reaction or saying to that person, you know, thank you for sharing that with me, and I need some time to process, and what does that look like? When can we get into this more? I think that's okay to do. Um, the other piece is there is a tweet, because we talked about the job search and how do you gauge whether or not the company, the department will be open and, and helps model or encourage self-care. And the Health and Wellness Committee, um, we see we have a tweet here, we'll actually be publishing a blog later on this week, so please look out for that. Um, so that way folks who are job searching, or folks, if you want to incorporate this into your interview questions as well, how do you let people know that this is the type of place we are? Like maybe we automatically put it out there for our candidates instead of waiting for them to ask, just something to think about. Um, and then another thing here on Twitter, um, for folks uh, who are not uh, tweeting at home, um, they said, you know, it's it's about overcoming the fear. There is a fear. There is, and we and we talked about that. There's a there's a cost. Um, it can be scary. What's going to happen? What do people think of me now? And I get that. And I, if I worried about what people thought about me, on top of all my other worries, I, I just I can't <laughs> I can't do that. But there are people who who that is a real fear for. And so again, it's about creating a community of support, and we've seen that that phrase "community and care" over and over again here on the Twitter, the, the Twitter feed. Very good. Um, so we'll jump to this last slide. We just have our contact information here. Um, I just wanted to invite you to uh, continue to uh, tweet if you want to tweet us a question. Uh, if you don't have Twitter and you want to email us, those are there. Um, so please feel free to send us any questions, any any lingering questions that we didn't get a chance to answer. We're happy to address. We'll take the time to answer all those if you want to send those our way. Um, so I uh, just wanted to invite you to do that and wanted to thank everyone uh, for participating. We appreciated uh, your thoughtfulness uh, and appreciate your, your time this morning. Um, Eric, do you have anything to close out? I just want to say thank you for your presentation today. Obviously, this is such a valuable um, topic in our field, and it's one that we don't necessarily always talk about. And so um, thank you very much for your attention for this and for, um, for the great information. Um, if you'd like to review the recording of this webinar, we will present it on our website, lukuvo.org, uh, under the resources heading, look for webinar archives. It'll be posted sometime tomorrow. If you do have any questions, be sure to email or tweet our presenters from today. I'm sure they would love to hear from you. If you have any questions for me, you can email me at technology at and I want to thank everyone for your attention today, and have a wonderful day.